for the first time ever on 60 Days In. We're going in as a united front. You're open. We signed up for this. <laughs> Would you? 60 Days In. New episode Thursday at 9. Part of the Pursuit, a crime and investigation event only on A&E. When I found out I was going to be a parent, I immediately felt a lot of anxiety and worry. So I went on to BetterHelp to try to look for a therapist to help me with that. My relationship with my family and with my boyfriend and with myself were suffering. I really needed help. I was ruminating a lot. Really getting those thoughts out to a therapist and getting feedback was just life-changing. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, learn more at BetterHelp.com. That's better H E L P dot com. You can support this podcast at Patreon dot com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoy, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And on this episode, an L.A. Times reporter traces a hotel overdose to the powerful dean of a medical school. But his investigation is stonewalled by the university and his own newspaper. We'll talk about Fallen Angels from iHeart Podcasts. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of the These Are Their Stories podcast, my husband and love of my life. Kevin Flynn. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Also with us is private investigator, certified pet detective, resident cat lady, and author of The Final Curtain, Laura Bricker. Hi, Laura. Hey, Rebecca. And I drove by the very spot where Maura Murray went missing this week. So I'm coming to you from northern New Hampshire right now. Yeah. You saw the woods. You saw the woods. I saw the woods. I saw the corner. I saw the buildings. And finally, our captain of all things cynical, author of the City Trilogy, host of Strange Arrivals, and our Patreon Deep Dive Book Club podcast host, Toby Ball. Hi, Toby. Hello, Rebecca. So, Kevin. Yes. This is obviously Monday's podcast. It's obvious to everyone listening. Uh, What is coming up on Thursday's show? On Thursday, we're talking about this incredible sports scandal. A feud among subcultures unlike any other. (laughs) It's called Broomgate, a curling scandal. Broomgate. Bristled. Bristled, yes. Stone cold. Stone cold where they throw those (laughs) those rocks. Yeah. Broom ha ha. Between a rock. Broom ha ha. There's a good good. one, yeah. Between a rock and a hard place. Man, we could just go on. We just got (laughs) so many great alternative names for these podcasts. Kevin, I hear you have a thank you that you'd like to uh, make in the podcast. We, the four of us, would like to thank our uh, longtime listener and friend of the show, Alyssa Dosman. Alyssa has been, you remember her, she runs... The Yoga Loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. And then she also uh, was involved with the Treehouse Yoga Studio. Down there in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, she has been supporting us as our studio sponsor for many years now. And Alyssa uh, is now ready to let someone else take on the honor of naming the studio and supporting us on Patreon. But we just can't, like, kick her off into the sunset without saying, like, How incredibly important she has been to the show. You heard the name of her business at the end of every episode of These Are Their Stories and Crime Writers On. And we always talk about Patreon because it's very important to podcasters like us. Your financial support sustains these podcasts. And you know, without it, it would be very difficult for Laura Bricker to fuck around in northern New Hampshire <laughs> <laughs> looking for Maura Murray. You know, and if you want to name the studio after my cats, I would totally be cool with that. Yeah. Um, or yourself. We're like we're like the New Hampshire License Plate Bureau, though. Like, we have to approve of the name. You can't just name the studio whatever you want. Like, we're not going to let you name it like... The Confederate flag studios. <laughs> oh, <laughs> or something oh, like that. oh, yeah. P before you go. <laughs> P, P before, before you P go. P before you go. It's a very inside New Hampshire joke oh, here. Yeah. That was the <laughs> that was the vanity license plate. P before you go. It spurred the that, lawsuit. Yeah, exactly. Famous yeah. lawsuit. Exactly. I, was, I was stuck behind them in a traffic jam in Concord. What? P before you go. They should have taken yep. their own advice. I know. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Huh. 
were you like very excited about that? Did you feel like you were stuck behind a celebrity? It, it was one of those double take things where I was like, oh, somebody's got a vanity plate. I was like, oh shit, it's the pee before you go. Pee. <laughs> <laughs> pee before you- if I was Laura Bricker, I would just abandon the car and go and try to knock on their window. <laughs> the greatest New Hampshire vanity plate is one that you can see in the parking lot of Rebecca's office. Yes. And it's my two- I think two, you've talked about it's, it. We, it's worth mentioning again. It's my two cents. Yes. But they don't have the E- <laughs> So it does look like something else. Oh, <laughs> oh! I want to buy a vowel. Yeah, that, buy British, a vowel. that British word that people just use like fuck all the time. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I would say I it know a little later in the show. I don't know why you have two of them, but <laughs> I, I, well, are they, you know, sugar gliders have two vaginas. <gasps> yes. Yeah. Are they side by side or one on top of each other? Um, I think they're side by side sugar glider vaginas. So do possums, by the way. <laughs> oh, <Okay>. super. <laughs> all right. Good we talk about this in my book club sometimes. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those license plates where like once you see it you can't unsee it i feel so bad like whenever anyone is at the station and like one of us is joking about it or mentioning it and then someone overhears you and then they're (laughs) tainted forever and then they can never unsee it you said taint (laughs) because it's just like always there that car that have you ever talked to the person with the my two cents i'm not laura bricker of course i haven't (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you're not Laura Bricker of course you have it okay there's also there's also a Mini Cooper across the street that has you know those um, wraps those like vinyl wraps you can put on cars yeah it's cheetah wrapped oh god <laughs> I have so many what? questions for that person that's hilarious wow I have so many questions for that person I also have questions for Steve who's like a major figure in our state. He has two cars, a giant old like vintage Chevy Suburban, like from the 90s that he used to drive around oh. when his kids were. Mm-hmm. Um, and a smart car, which looks like he's wearing it like a suit. It's the a most- little tiny. <laughs> That's talk yeah. about one extreme to the other. I have so many questions for some yeah. people with their cars. <laughs> Man, this is some Pulitzer level investigative <laughs> reporting we've got I'm going on here. People are really right? glad they're, lis- they're listening to I us know, right now. I know. Anyway, <laughs> Thanks, Alyssa. Yes. Uh, you are very special to us. Yeah. And um, she supported us what do you drive? for like six, seven years. <laughs> what do you drive? I went to one of her yoga classes during the COVID time. Yeah. I right. went to a virtual yoga class there with some lady that listens to us that was living in Germany. So thank you, Alyssa. Can I say one more thank you? Sure. Thank you to you, Kevin, for coming last night and supporting me during my interview with Doris Kearns Goodwin. Oh, sure, yeah. You were wonderful. Presidential historian. You're a wonderful uh, spouse backstage, very supportive and um, very, very fanboy in a very adorable way. You got to talk about JFK and LBJ, and I talked to her about the Red Sox. Yes. So, Dream oh. come true for you. Dream come true for me. Yes. 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 So thank you yeah. very much yeah. for that. And also thank you to everybody that reacted to last week's show about me talking about how I beat cancer. And I got to say, if you can't get a like for saying that you beat cancer you should just get the fuck off of social media <laughs> if people are like eh, if you died it would have been okay with me too <laughs> oh who said just, that nobody but i mean okay, it's good. like it's probably it's the easiest <gasps> it's the lowest stakes thumbs up you can give are on facebook getting, are you getting some insight now into some of those people who like their whole personality becomes about their cancer journey now oh, my oh God. i know some of those people <laughs> 30 years later they're all still right. talking about it. Can we get it. to this really great podcast <laughs> yes, that I like to yes, talk about? Right. Okay, all right. Yeah, I was about to say, people are just assuming we're going to dump on this thing at this point. Yeah. All right, let's talk about it. Should we go ahead and drop that first clip now, Kevin? Yeah, let's do it. Let's get it done. Lead off. Leading off. In the wheelchair was this very young lady that was clearly too young to be with this gentleman. She was literally like a rag doll in the chair all her limbs just completely just dead weight workers discover a young woman has overdosed in a hotel room filled with drugs and a video camera but the police never take any action against the older man who was with her after getting a tip la times investigative reporter paul pringle learns the man is dr carmen pugliafito the dean of usc's medical school who's been living a secret life of hard drugs and coercive sex with the victim you can write a story that explains why having a powerful person who's also an eye surgeon in a position overseeing young students and doing all these drugs and associating with criminals is not an ideal situation. Pringle and his colleagues are stonewalled by Pasadena police and the administration at USC. But once they uncover enough to print an explosive story about Pugliafito in the medical school, they find their own editors are slow walking the expose on the powerful university. Matt and I sit across from Dave on a mark, and after months of investigation and vetting and editing, 
Davon tells us his decision. We're not going to publish this story, he says. And rather than offer any coherent reason, he makes it personal. From iHeart Podcast and Best Case Studios comes Fallen Angels, a story of California corruption. Pringle recounts the steps of his investigation into Puglia Fido and lengths taken by USC to cover up the scandal. Pringle also points fingers at the bosses in his own paper who acted as if they were in cahoots with a university to kill the story. Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about some pretty significant plot points from Fallen Angels. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes for our thumbs up or thumbs down reviews. Now, Laura, you love a podcast about journalism, right? I do. And the journalism part of this podcast just had my blood boiling and at the same time, like simultaneously cheering for the secret squad of reporters that got together to like make sure that that story was going to come out. So I love kind of pulling the curtain back. And I love the fact that they're pulling the curtain back on the LA Times. So this isn't like just like an inconsequential, you know, newspaper. This is a pretty big deal. And the fact that they are all going public and naming names of the editors and the people that didn't want to publish this story. For me, that was the part that I really latched onto with this. And I feel like that really could have just been the whole podcast. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Toby? I mean, because this podcast isn't just about the reporting. It's also about the media, right? Yeah, well, I guess it's about reporting media and the and the actual crime. Uh, yeah, I think there's a bunch of interesting stuff, particularly around the LA Times and how, you know, during a time when traditional media organizations are really struggling, especially with revenue issues, because the old revenue models aren't, aren't working. Uh, some of the stuff they get into about what the LA Times did kind of in response to this, especially with personnel, I thought was really interesting. But this idea that you would have the editor-in-chief and the publisher be the same person. So you've got one person who's in charge of the news, like the the actual product you're putting out there. And then that same person is also responsible for like keeping the place going financially. I mean, it seems like a third grader would see what the problems with, with having that arrangement would be. And I, I think they do a good job of, I mean, there's a lot of this story is an illustration of, how that the need to make money versus the need to do reporting can be at odds. I mean, I think it succeeded in everything it tried to do. And I think it tried to do three big things. You know, that's a juggling act that they, that they pulled off. Yeah. Kevin Pringle doesn't shy away from going at his own publication at all. No, I was kind of blown away. Like when he did it once, I was like, Oh, that's kind of daring. And the second time I'm like, there's no fucking way this is an LA times podcast. (laughs) And you know, there's a little extra zeal gives a little extra welly in the the story when they talk about how the editors try to block or water down those stories because it's an unforgivable professional sin. Right. And I mean, they do leave it up to us to infer why they were carrying USC's water. Maybe it was the promotional partnerships. Maybe it is just, you know, financial or old boy network or whatever it is. But yeah, that was great. And I'm with Lara. I love this, you know, this secret team here of reporters. You know, they're like the insubordinate spotlight team. I want to picture like the way they got together. And to me, it was like somebody would pull a uh, hardcover book off a shelf and a panel would spin around and they would go into this bat cave. It was a motley crew of people on this team, you know, different ages, different genders, different perspectives, different skill sets. Together, we're going to find out the truth about Poliofito and whatever USC is trying to cover up. And we're going to make sure the story gets out there, no matter what our bosses have told us. It was super fun. Like, I loved that secret reporting team. And I was like, I want to hang out with them, especially Harriet. (laughs) <laughs> Harriet, who was like, I like the element of a caper. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I want to go on a caper with Harriet. But it was like they picked like the squad of everybody that had some skill that was going to help them with this. And when they started like trying to figure out who this woman was, Sarah, when when they started going through Poliofito's friends list, I'm like, oh, this is, this is so something I would love to be involved with. Um, and then they're like, oh, they have all these like people that look normal. And wait, these people look a little like, mm, not like people that would be friends with this guy. Red flag. You know what this reminded me a lot of was that uh, storyline in Catch and Kill when Ronan Farrow was talking about trying to report the Harvey Weinstein story for NBC News Mm -hmm. and it just got delayed and delayed and it was like, now it's in legal, now it needs more review, now it needs this and now it needs that. And then when he went to the New Yorker, 
they were like, oh, this has been ready to go for a while. It's good. Let's publish it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the New Yorker just didn't have the same level of fear because they didn't have the, the media crossover. It's interesting what you said, Toby, about the publisher versus editor in chief thing. There's clearly a conflict there, but that kind of business editorial thing crossover is not nearly as unusual as you would imagine. It's not the same per se, but um, I don't think people really understand how like big media companies are working today. Like at the New York Times, for instance, they have a huge marketing department, like more than 100 people. And the marketing department very much drives the editorial product in big ways. So the marketing department is able to look at the analytics of what readers engage with and what users like. They call them users, and that's what we call them in media. And that then they will say, like, we should be making more of this. We should be doing more of this kind of coverage. We should be having products like this. Like, And yes, there are teams that are able to, like, just do the reporting stuff, which, you know, is is integral, obviously, like the spotlight team at the Boston Globe works in a silo. At my outlet, it's the document team that works in a silo. That's really essential. But that was not happening at this paper, clearly. But I do think in this era, like, I think it's important for the public to understand and it like how this is really working, because there is this like, I think, purist imagination of how media is supposed to be that just doesn't exist anymore. And it is it's sad, you know. I think there's a little bit of a difference between having marketing people say, well, these are, these are the stories that are getting hit. So let's, let's go with more of those. And then what's happening here or what happened in catch and kill. I think you can also talk about the whole Samuel Lito thing that the Washington post sat on for a couple of years. You know, in, in the, in the case of the LA times, it seems like it's not that they think that people aren't going to be interested in it. Mm. It's that they don't want to, screw up a relationship, which I mean, I think that the thing that they they talk about in the podcast specifically is that USC is is their first year hosting the uh, Los Angeles festival uh, of books. Book, book festival or festival of books or whatever. That's like a huge, huge, huge deal. So putting stress on that relationship with USC seems like it probably drove editorial decisions. Yeah. Don't you think too, Laura, that they're afraid of the legal, potential legal ramifications? I mean, the USC proved going to court over and over and over again that they were winners. I mean, they were doing all sorts of shady stuff, poaching entire labs from other universities, like doing things that, you know, if they were another kind of entity, like they would completely have to have consequences for. And USC never seemed to face any consequences for anything. Right. And I mean, I mean, that's the whole thing is like, you know, in the legal system, it's like who has the deepest pockets and who can keep going and who has in that case, the team behind them that's going to continue to force this issue so that the others are like, yeah, okay, we don't want to deal with that because that's going to be a total pain in the ass, right? We know they're just going to litigate everything or whatever. But it, it, it's frustrating because, you know, when you're going back to like talking about that relationship between the editor and the publisher and like, you know, actually getting the news out there and actually, you know, going back to what I always say, like you're a journalist, you're a community watchdog, this is your role. And, and so when that's complicated in situations like this, it's so fucking frustrating. I mean, I, I remember when I was like full-time newspaper reporter, our publisher, he was friends with all of the people, like he was very involved in the business community, but he never once stepped in and told us not to do something editorially. So when you hear about a newspaper like this that should know better, that you would think would have standards, it's like, what the fuck? I'll say the same thing. I, I report directly to the CEO of my outlet And, you know, sometimes he'll ask questions about what we're working on or whatever. Recently, we were working on a thing about something that's been in the news. My podcast did something about NPR reporting and NPR obviously has been in the news lately for various reasons. And he said to me in a meeting, he's like, is is there going to be something in here that like could be like not great for NPR? And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, well, I'm not asking you that because I want you to change it. I'm just asking you because I'm legitimately curious. And like, I'm, you know, if I get a phone call, like, should I be prepared for a phone call? Like he had no interest in any way, like asking a question that was interfering. It was just like, you know, sh- should I maybe expect a phone call? You know, that's that's the boss you want, right? Right. The, the one that you can actually have the conversation with about what you're working on, who's not going to like give you any shit because he understands the job. Luckily, the CEO of my outlet is a former journalist, which really really helps. Because I mean, there is a legal, when you're talking about legal, like there is a legal angle to reporting and also clearing things before you print them to make sure you're not going to be held liable, right? Absolutely. So like, I remember one time I had gotten this like secret report leaked to me about this police department that had a lot of issues. And I got the report that was done on this police department and it was a legitimate report, but that had to go through the legal people before I could publish it. 
So it's like, yeah, there's a, there is that component, but in this case it was just stonewalling. And every time I was just like, this is maddening to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did you talk about in fallen angels about the process? I mean, they, they, you know, that they do bring it to lawyers to vet it, but you know, they kept giving their thumbs up to like these things that, that seem to be the editors, you know, their own sort of judgment to pull back on it. Like, Oh, this is going to make the guy look bad essentially. And like, yeah. You know, that's, that's the point. That's kind of the point. Because <laughs> he's least, an idiot. Yeah. I mean, what do you say? You know, you print without fear or favor. And um, th- that seemed to be like something that they just, that they were self-censoring. And there's reasons, you know, that sometimes a journalist or editors do that because they fear legal consequences and that, you know, they're unsure about like whether or not they'll get sued or whether or not if they get sued if they have some exposure. But this doesn't seem to be a case at all of the editors like feeling like, uh, you know, just like, well, this isn't ready. It's like, obviously it's ready. You know, it just stunk. Yeah. I mean, as somebody who worked on a project, you know, on the side of working on a project that we were being sued while the project was being worked on the 13th step, our lawyer is in the credits of that podcast. Yeah, right. I mean, and it was not a separate. And I think that that was, it was really interesting because that was so, you know, it was so important that he be involved in every sort of step, but that, that he was actually like working with her. It wasn't separate. It wasn't like, yeah. oh, the outlet will now handle the legal vetting. It was like, no, like bring the lawyer in with the reporting team so that there won't be a process where it will take 17 years mm-hmm. to finish it. That's really important, right? Yeah. I think it's important. Yeah. And to this day, you know, there's a little disclaimer at the end of every episode about how those uh, those editors to this day say that they, uh, you know, they defend their own work. They like, didn't do anything that's, wrong. So that's something that probably a lawyer said should be adding to this podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> about legal exposure. Yeah. I keep waiting for you to go to the business section, Kevin. I, I, I was waiting yeah. that whole time. You I was all like, time for the business you section? Know, you yeah. won't get sued for. <laughs> Just join yeah. our Patreon or something. Oh, you know, there we are. There you go. Yeah. We're, we won't get we sued for signing up for Patreon. We don't have to run that by our lawyers. No. If you, sign, if you join us at patreon.com nice slash partners in crime media, uh, you'll get all sorts of great stuff. you get the crime writers on after show. Yes. This week's after show. Rebecca, what are we talking about? Uh, we're going to talk about what's going on with Leo Schofield in the Bone Valley case. I listened to the new bonus episode that was put out in uh, Bone Valley. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about that. I mean, he was in prison for 36 years and the episode is all about what happens sort of on his first day out. It's really interesting. That's great. That's great. Um, other exclusive podcasts that you get to listen to include Married With Podcast. We have a live Married With Podcast streaming event coming up on June 19th. We'll be live and uh, people will be able to come in and ask their questions or give their smart-ass answers because we give smart-ass answers to life advice that people really shouldn't take. I mean, it's not like we are... We're a doctor um, who's uh, uh, doing speak crystal meth yourself. and doing eye surgery on the side. Yeah, if you speak for yourself. People say I give really good advice. You give really good advice. You do I, give good advice. I Thank give, you. I give moderately good advice. And uh, also on Tuesday, we've got another live event. Toby's going to be recording The Deep Dive. And the book is The Good Girls. And Toby, don't give everything away, but you know where do you fall on this book? Uh, yeah, I liked it. It's about uh, two girls who are found hung from a tree in rural India and sort of the story that leads up to it and, and sort of the aftermath. Um, and you just you learn a, a hell of a lot about India. And I, I think there's there's a couple issues with the book, which I think we'll probably talk about. But uh, but basically, I liked it. It's a super quick read. And I think it'll be a good discussion. That's great. Laura Bricker has her own exclusive podcast. It's called Leave It to Bricker. And on the latest episode, uh, Laura sits down with her guy friend and talks about their trip to... A man friend. A man friend. My man friend. man friend. (laughs) About about their trip to a burlesque show. And if you ever thought, like, what would happen if chatty Laura Bricker... Went to a burlesque show and started <laughs> talking to the people in the crowd who would go to a burlesque show. This is the six dollars you want to spend Wait, in June. No shame in going to burlesque shows. No, no, you're not shaming that. No, no, yeah. no, no, because Kevin's going to the next one. The Empire Strips Back. Yeah. He just yeah. doesn't know it yet. I'll go at the uh, exclusive Patreon level. Yeah. Of, at the ten dollar level, Kevin will go to the Empire Strips Back. Yeah, remember if you join us at the Let's Do What We Do level, you can get episodes of Crime Writers on early and ad free. And we say ad free, we mean no ads. But you still get the business section. People love it. Although I thought it would be better 
and more valuable to skip this section. But you people said, no, we want to give you money to hear less of you, but not that much less of you. I know. We actually, like, tried it without the business section, got complaints. Got complaints. (laughs) All right, Kevin. uh, Speaking of, does thus end the business section? Uh, Thus ends the business section. But one one last thing. Oh, I guess, no, this doesn't end the business section. Sign up for our newsletter. It's fucking awesome. It's basically like Kevin Flynn's personal diary about this podcast. Rebecca, if I wanted to mention the newsletter in this business section, I would have mentioned it. I am mentioning it. I love the newsletter. I look forward to getting it every week. I never know what's going to be in it. It's always a delightful surprise. So I'm selling it for you right now, Kevin. Go to CrimeWritersOn.com and sign up for the newsletter that Kevin spends a lot of time thinking about and pouring his heart into. CrimeWritersOn.com, it's free. The newsletter, it's super fun. All right, does thus end the business section? Unless you're going to come in with something else, I assume so. Thus ends the Uh, business section. I'm going to fade that music out now, Kevin. Is that all right? Do it. All right. So, Kevin, who's sponsoring the podcast this time around? Uh, we're brought to you by HelloFresh. Oh, I love HelloFresh. Make delicious food a priority this summer with quick, convenient recipes delivered right to your door with HelloFresh. Now, you can just choose the meals you want, select your delivery date, and HelloFresh handles all the meal planning, shipping, and most of the prep. So all you have to do is open the box and you get cooking. So we just got our latest delivery of HelloFresh. We got three delicious meals for four people. And can I tell you the one that I like the most? Actually, I really liked all three of these. I like them too. They're great. Um, the fully loaded pork taquitos. Oh, those were freaking awesome. With pico de gallo, creamy guacamole, and hot sauce. And you know what I'm so proud of? What? That I uh, learned how to zest a lime. I was really proud nice, of you too. Yeah, it yeah. really added. Like, you said what the flavors were clean. They were very bright. Bright, that's the flavors. It. it was very, very bright, very clean, very easy to make meal. And I was actually surprised because there were very, very few ingredients compared to like what I was expecting. It was very uncomplicated and very delicious. Yeah, skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Just go to HelloFresh.com slash Crime Writers Apps. Crime Writers Apps. For free appetizers for life. Ah, that's okay. We got those, remember? Yes. Spring rolls, one appetizer item per box while your subscription is active. That's free appetizers for life at HelloFresh.com slash Crime Crime Writers Writers Apps. Apps. Two Ps. So, Kevin, who's sponsoring the podcast this time around? Well, it's our friends from Quince. Ooh, oh my God. <laughs> the weather's getting warmer. Time to ditch the jackets and sweaters and shorts and tees. Just get ready for summer. Why waste money on clothes that will only last one season? Why? Why do it? Quince Why do it? Is- Go to Quince. Kevin, did I not just buy you the best shirt? Yeah, you no, know, it's funny because like I have here like this first bullet point. Quince has all of the seasonal must-haves like... Linen shirts. 100% European linen shirts from $30. I literally just bought bought you a European linen shirt from Quince. It was wonderful. It fit great. It held up great in the wash. Yeah, I love my Um, linen shirts from Quince. Love them. Yeah, I'm definitely going to wear it all summer long. And you wonder, like, how do they get things like at these great prices? You should rest assured that Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices along with premium fabrics and finishes. And you look good AF. Upgrade your wardrobe. Go to quince.com slash crime Crime. for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash crime Crime. to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash crime. Crime. Okay, Kevin, so who is our next sponsor in this podcast? We're sponsored by Shopify. I know them. Yeah, I mean, we talk about, like, sleuthing partners that get things done, like uh, Frank and Joe. Oh, yeah, Frank and Joe. Who? Frank and Joe who? I don't know who Frank and Joe are. The Hardy Boys! (laughs) Oh, please, that was a boy's book. (laughs) Okay. I don't want to be gendered, but come on. All right, what about Bess and George? Oh, they were Nancy Drew's friends? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. They got it done. How about um, Holt and Steele? From Remington and Steele? Yeah, what were their first names? Remington. Steele. And Stephanie? Stephanie Zimbles was Laura Holtz. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, talk about uh, perfect partners when it comes to solving crimes, but what about the perfect partners when it comes to growing your business? Hmm. That's you and Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling sleuthing supplies (laughs) or marketing mystery merch, (laughs) maybe it's those online courses for cat detective school. (laughs) 
<laughs> Shopify will help you sell everywhere. Kevin, if you ever bought anything online, Shopify is everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, from their all-in-one uh, e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever or whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. And Shopify helps you turn. That even includes like out the back of your uh, mystery machine. That's right. You can sell the swag. <laughs> and Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. Sign up for a $1 a month trial period at shopify.com slash crime writers. Crime writers. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash crime writers. Crime writers. Now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash crime writers. Crime writers. So, Toby, this podcast starts with Sarah Warren. She is the woman who was in the hotel room with Pugliafito uh, when that hotel worker actually saw them. And he was the one who ended up providing the tip to the L.A. Times eventually. He actually tried to call USC. He did call USC. And thank God he had the receipts for that. Um, what did you think about the Sarah Warren sort of branch of the story of this podcast and the, their pursuit of trying to track that down? It's it's depressing. You know, it's it's a story of a powerful guy with a lot of money and influence. And he comes across this young woman and proceeds to literally ruin her life. One rehab I actually got kicked out of because he later came back and brought me champagne and like dildos and like Xanax bars. And then like 4 a.m. the next morning, he brought like meth and a torch. When you're introduced to her, she's kind of like comatose after ODing on drugs that she was doing with him. He doesn't want the paramedics to come, but, you know, the hotel kind of insists on it. But as the investigation goes along and then you kind of the where are they now kind of thing, like she's dead within what, like three or four years Mm -hmm. of interacting with him. So, I mean, it's. I mean, maybe it doesn't rise to the level of murder in the eyes of the law, but basically her trajectory went straight down from the moment that she started interacting with him. And so did her brothers Mm -hmm. and her parents kind of saw this happening and, and were sort of unable to provide the counterbalance or pull them away from the orbit of this guy. I mean, it, it, it's sorted, you know, it, it really is like his worst instincts and character traits were just absolutely directed towards her and uh what what ended up was a tragedy it's hard to get clean when your uh very rich sugar daddy keeps sending you drugs and dildos when you are in rehab mm. and trying to get clean and then he gets his claws as you say like into the brother in the nose snitches and we hear about the stuff. other woman also with yeah, the, the sister well, of the other woman that but we hear yeah, just about? to come you know to follow up on on toby's point about sarah's death like they reveal that she she died. I'm like, oh, she overdosed, right? That just no, but she did, she had just done so much physical damage that she passed away. I don't know, it's natural causes. I don't know if that's what you'd call natural causes, but it, it wasn't because alcoholism. Yeah, you know, destroyed her uh, her liver and. Um, but I mean, so young, right? And then the brother too. Just so sad. I felt so so badly for those parents. I mean, Laura, didn't you find yourself wondering when we hear about the other woman who? also was involved. I mean, didn't you find yourself wondering like how many women are there like this, that this man has pulled in and like, I mean, first of all, he must make a lot of money that he can like, you know, put all these people up in apartments and like fund all these lifestyles and buy Mm -hmm. that many drugs. And apparently his office staff knows exactly what's going on because they're, remember they they said his, his secretary was like terrified when the brother came in and it was very clear that she was terrified of him and all that stuff. Um, and we heard about the, the dead baby, the baby who died of the meth overdose after like going over to the house one time. Didn't you find yourself wondering like how many young women might be sort of still ensnared with this guy? It, it's, it kind of reminds me like when we hear these stories that we've, we've talked about in the past, like Epstein or like people that are preying upon like vulnerable people that are more insecure financially, emotionally, et cetera. But it's like, How is it that somebody can continue to keep up this behavior and keep all these balls in the air and still have his job? Um, He's married. But, you know, when I was listening to them talk about the hotel where they were putting up Sarah, it was like, it reminded me, it was like one of those like rooms for a night or a lifetime kind of places. It was like, they're the only luxury boutique hotel, but it's 119 a night. And, you know, it used to be a retirement home. And that for me kind of set the scene 
in a way that, you know, he is able to have no consequences for so long because these are people that are not able to advocate for themselves in any way. And their families are shut out because they're isolated. And, you know, I wonder this podcast coming out, obviously it's based on a book, which already came out. The news is out there, but you do kind of wonder like, how long is this going to continue with this guy? Right. These are not the people that stop this behavior just because they got caught. Right. 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 So Toby, the podcast takes a shift in the last three episodes toward a second story of a cover up, cover up at USC. Uh, this gynecologist, Dr. Tyndall, who apparently abused many, 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 many women who went to him for treatment. So much so that the staff of the medical offices there would like try to get women to not see him uh, when they'd go in for appointments. You know, this to me almost felt like a second podcast within the podcast, but it's basically sort of another story that this team also reported on. What did you think of this story and how it fit within this podcast narrative? Yeah. So this story is kind of like Larry Nasser, but without the U.S. gymnastics connection. I mean, it's a, it's a very similar thing. You know, I get what they're trying to do, which is to say that this isn't just a problem with one person. Like this is an institutional problem. Like there's survival of the institution ends up taking precedence over every everything else. You know, I'm used to doctors being friendly, but detached, not not with such a big smile. And I remember that being a little strange. He also locked the door for me. He didn't close the privacy screen and he made me change in front of him. And then when I was changing in front of him, he turned to the side, but I could I could see that he was looking at me out of the corner of my eye, I could see his eyes looking. And I remember thinking, I don't know what's going on. Let's just get this over with. So I, I thought that was an important point to make. I think whether it justifies spending three episodes away from Pugliafito, who seems like the, the real core of the story, I don't know. But I do think, I think it was important to get that in there to give context to sort of the institutional amorality at USC. And so you see it's just not this one-off situation. Yeah, I agree with that. If I have a quibble, uh, it is that that the pivot to Dr. George Tyndall in those last three episodes kind of felt out of place for me. Yeah, because I mean, although, you know, it's connected to USC's powerful reach and that whole theme. We don't know that it's coming until sort of this last half. And you're right. We think it's um, the story of Polifido, but um, it's like as if Tom Hanks saves Private Ryan and then the movie goes on for another 45 minutes. Which it and does. They save another but then they go and they save a whole other soldier. It just, you know, in a way they sacrifice the narrative cohesion for chronology. I understand like why it belongs in there and it was probably part of the book. It just ended up feeling unbalanced narratively to move there. And, you know, if I could say, hey, man, season two, this would have been That's perfect. That's what I would have done. But I mean, there are other considerations, but, you know, I mean, this is iHeart podcast, so we understand like their requirements for uh Length. yeah for for seasonal structure and whatnot again it's a quibble but i did feel like i had no idea this whole other doctor story was coming it wasn't telegraphed in any way laura i kind of thought when i was listening to it too and you know it was a diversion like a, a sideways term but i also thought there's probably a lot there with this doctor dude a lot yeah Probably a lot of victims, probably a lot more. And this this could probably be a whole season uh, story that could probably go into like more even about you. Like we could make a multi-season podcast about, probably, about USC. Right. What do you think? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, I mean, I guess it's more than a quibble for me because I felt like for me, the heart of this podcast was the journalism story with regard to a story getting quashed and the lengths they went to to get it published. And the story of Poliofito and Sarah, and we've got Sarah's family. That was complete in itself for me. I feel like I did not need the second story. I'm like, the second story is its own podcast. They could have mentioned it in passing, but it, for me, just kind of like, I was like, oh, well, now we're on to this. And at that point, I was not invested in hearing that part of the story because I was still like thinking about how pissed I was at the LA Times for trying to quash the story. And I was like upset about this girl dying because this guy's sending her drugs in a hotel room. And like that to me was- and a baby like, dying. The baby dying. Like yeah. there was plenty 
to like have that be complete in itself. And I feel like that was a story that could have just stood on its own. And and for me, I think it should have stood on its own. I, I think like Rebecca said, season two, next thing. We can tease at the end of this one, hey, come back for season two where we're going to tell you what else has been going on at USC. Right, right. And I also think you could make hay, and granted, he didn't write a book about it. You could also make hay out of their part in the college cheating scandal. You could make hay out of so many things. By the way, you know that Lori Loughlin's like, daughter was on a yacht with like the chair of the board of USC when the cheating scandal broke or some shit like that. Sure, Paul Pringle knows that, yeah. Like there's some like, there's some amazing stuff attached to this school and the people around the school and the money and the board members. Like, honestly, it could be, this is like, you know, that Malibu podcast that Dana Goodyear does. Like this is like the flip side of that podcast where there's actually so much there there in this like place that's supposed to be so perfect. Okay, so I just want to say briefly, during the gynecology story, so many things happened. That professor who talks about being fired because she swore Mm -hmm. in a video, okay? Fruit flies. (laughs) (laughs) There were, yeah, flies in the office. Uh, We have the guy who, the guy died before he was, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. ended up being prosecuted. We have the women who end up going to the other doctors and being like, aren't you going to relax my vaginal muscles before you do these? And the other doctors being like, what? Like there was so much rich detail that I just feel like didn't necessarily get the serve. I mean, that was my issue with it. Like this story deserved more. And he brings out a book. Yes. It's like, see, it's all in this book. Except for this page and closes. He spent yeah. 10 hours with him. Dr. Tundle, do you understand that people are accusing you of sexually assaulting young women for decades? He had made a lot of arguments at that point And we had moved past them. And I think when you just said it like that, he finally got that we were not going to be talked into adopting his point of view on his medical practice. There's a lot there. And I just felt like maybe it deserved more time than it got. Then I would have definitely blown it up into a season. When you start with Sitgo, you're good to go. But good to go where? Good to go skydiving? <laughs> Good to go for a shiatsu massage to a balloon animal convention. Wherever the road leads, when you start with Sitgo, you're good to go. A&E's crime and investigation event, The Pursuit, returns with a new, unprecedented season of 60 Days In. This time, we're going in as a united front. (laughs) Together, as one team, with one unified mission. We are determined to expose what's really going on. Get off! We signed up for this. Ah! Would you? 60 Days In, new episode Thursday at 9, part of The Pursuit, a crime and investigation event, only on A&E. For 25 years, Mike's has been making lemonade the hard way. Mike's Hard Lemonade. Hard days deserve a hard lemonade. Mike's is hard. So is prison. Don't drive drunk. Premium all beverage with flavors. All registered trademarks used under license by Mike's Hard Lemonade Company, Chicago, Illinois. Not everything in life is flexible, but at Capella University, your education can be. With our game-changing FlexPath learning format, you're empowered to fit education into your life without putting other priorities on hold. FlexPath lets you set your own deadlines and adjust them when needed. You can take courses at your own speed and move on to the next one when you're ready. Imagine how a flexible education can make a difference in your life at capella.edu. All right, let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they check out the podcast, Fallen Angels? Laura Bricker, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for this podcast? So I'm going to go mild thumbs up for this podcast. I think this was a great story of journalism, which is something I love hearing. I love when journalists like actually fight to get stories out that need to be published. And that is, that's what happened in this case. We've got corruption. We've got institutional corruption. For me, I feel like it went on too long. Then it it started to lose its punch. Uh, And I feel like there were some things I would have done a little bit differently. You know, overall, I think this is a story, you know, based on a book and now it's been adapted for podcast. If you want to get your justice hackles up and go out and do some rage walking, listen to the first half of this and you will certainly do that. The second half I was not as invested in. So that is why I'm mild thumbs up. Toby Ball, thumbs up or thumbs down for Fallen Angels. Yeah, I'm a pretty solid thumbs up. I think it's really, there's only a couple of episodes that are mostly doing the other story. Or, or possibly three. So I think I think the issue, and I imagine we're all going to say some form of this, is there's like 
the central story, which is fascinating. And there's a lot about journalism, both sort of being a reporter and sort of the business of journalism, as well as this sort of crime story that it's covering. It veers off a little bit towards the end before kind of pulling it back. But that's that's really the only thing I think that keeps it from being like a really, really strong thumbs up is I, I think they, they ended up probably having to put in a few extra episodes. And so I feel like it kind of detracts from the overall. But the main story is fascinating and excellent. And it's really interesting to hear people working at like a top, top newspaper being super, super critical of the leadership. Again, I was super engaged in it until last couple of episodes, but I don't want to sort of overreact to it because the stuff that came before was was awesome. So I'm, I'm a solid thumbs up. Kevin Flynn. Yeah, I mean, I'm also a, a solid thumbs up. This for me is like a top three podcast for this year. Uh, although there's not a lot of extemporaneous audio, you know, because they went into this reporting not thinking there'd be a podcast, but Pringle and his colleagues really do a great job of bringing us back into that investigation through their recollection. I'm reminded of some great podcasts like Gladiator, like The Retrievals, things that show and feature the power of schools like Yale and Columbia and Florida State to control those accountability institutions, the police, the DAs, to bury bad press. And, you know, we get to see a little bit on the inside of like how that actually happened in in one of the two main institutions that they, you know, that they tease like the corruption of these large institutions. The second one here is the LA Times. I agree with uh, everybody else that sort of this last quarter or one third of the podcast where they pivot to a different story sort of changed the, the flow of the entire season. Although there are thematic connections between these two cases, it just, uh, it, it felt like a weird shift But, you know, despite that, the stuff that's good is great. So that's why I'm thumbs up. Yeah, I'm thumbs up, too. Uh, I just want to make an observation that the narrator of this podcast sounds exactly like someone I work with. And uh, I know that's neither here nor there, but I had to say that his name's Dan Tui and they are vocal twins. Uh, Anyway, I really like this podcast a lot. I thought it was the look inside the journalism part, the willingness to sort of go after your employer so fun. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. And I, I think it's great. Um, And you should, when you're a journalist, you should be able to do that. Like, I always think about David Falkenflick, who reports very critically on NPR when it is time to do that. You know, Falkenflick today has a story out as we, as we tape this about the new publisher of the Washington Post, the new editor in chief, and uh, how there's this very critical story about somebody trying to, him trying to coerce someone to kill a story. And Falkenflick says, I know because once he tried that with me and like I just love that I love it when reporters have the freedom to publish because they know it's the right thing to do and their editors are behind them and I think that the power of you know the editor being behind you is really what's demonstrated in this podcast and I really really like that and I think that in a time when journalism is seen by the public increasingly as an untrustworthy thing it is really important for people to understand how it's supposed to work uh, when there's so much like stuff out there pretending to be journalism like this is how it is actually supposed to work and I really really think a podcast that demonstrates demonstrates that is important. And um, this one did that in a really compelling way. So yeah, thumbs up for me for Fallen Angels. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, a little something I like to call the crime of the week. That the crime of the week. Deputies in Alabama have a mystery on their hands. They received a call to track down a little boy who decided to run away. As they said on social media, it all started when a youngster decided to embark on an adventure, leaving home in search of a new life. Hey, we've all been there. Mm -hmm. They said that? We've all been there? Yeah, we've all been there. Huh. Authorities found the boy safe and sound, but they were puzzled by what he'd taken with him. They found a live rooster in his backpack. What's more, the rooster wasn't his, and they have no idea who it belongs to. The deputies named the bird Old Foghorn. The boy wasn't giving up where he purloined the rooster. And until the owner comes forward, they've given this cock to the lady at animal control. And they gave the lady the cock. <laughs> oh, stop it. That's literally <laughs> what the animal is called. It's like, it's like you know, the ass. Yeah. 
You know? <laughs> they gave the lady the ass. Stop it. Hey, <laughs> my college mascot was the bantam cock. Exactly. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So, panel, it's unclear why this chicken crossed the road with the young runaway. So what do you think they're planning to do together? Laura Bricker, what do you think? I mean, they were clearly going on a great all-American road trip and they weren't going to have to stop for food. They'd have eggs every day. Mm. He's liberating the chicken. It was kind of like an emotional support animal. You think he was going to have eggs every day with his rooster? <laughs> Wait a minute. Like, <laughs> Didn't you go let's to like just farm leave that. school let's or just, something? Yeah, let's just leave it there, Lar. What do you uh, think, Toby, this boy and this rooster were planning to do? I'm kind rooster? of at a loss for words. Um, was it a talking rooster? <laughs> I don't know. They were going to drink the rooster's milk. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. If it's not a talking rooster, I don't have any opinions. <laughs> what do you think, Kevin? Uh, well, they're going to pick up chicks. Oh. And start a fight club. Okay. Yeah. And raid the hen house, maybe? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Foxes raid the hen house. I have another answer. I have another answer. I know, you can't give it. Go ahead. All right, fine. You want to redeem yourself? Go ahead. I'll let you do that. Go ahead. Uh, farm to table chicken wings? I don't know. That's fine. Yeah, sure. sure. But we're leaving the first one in 100%. Paul Pringle is so disappointed in you. <laughs> All right, Laura Bricker. If folks want to reach out to you and school you on the uh, sex of chicken <laughs> required needed to lay eggs, how can you be found on social media? Uh, you can find me at Laura Bricker on Twitter and Instagram. And tell me about folks want to find out more about your college mascot. How can you be found online? I, there's not a whole lot more to say, but I'm at Toby Ball NH. And Kevin Flynn, if folks want to find out what your other two top podcasts of the year are so far, how can you be found? Yeah, you can get me at Kevin P. Flynn. And you can follow me everywhere on Twitter or Instagram. You can see pictures of me with my new BFF, Dora, Doris Kearns Goodwin. You can also follow the show everywhere at Crime Writers On. You can follow us on YouTube, on Reddit, but mostly I encourage you to join our incredible community in our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. Recently I had someone tell me they haven't been on Facebook in years. They came back on in order to join our group mm. and they do not regret it because the group is that awesome. Super. Just go to our regular Facebook page. There's a Pin post there to join the group. Join the group. It's freaking rad. Get episodes early and ad free at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. You'll get the crime writers on after show married with podcast, Laura Bricker's leave it to Bricker podcast and Toby Ball's deep dive book club podcasts. Our theme song was composed and performed by Ty Gibbons. Our editor is the terrific Livy Burdett. The executive producer of this program is Kevin Flynn. This show was recorded. The site one last time. Shall we, Kevin? In no, the, we're going to keep calling that. In we'll the Treehouse Yoga Studio, above the Mockingbird Cafe in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi Studio, otherwise known as Studio C, The Closet, in our New Hampshire basement, where we also shit talk the many crappy editors that we've worked with. On behalf of all the crime Fucking writers, Ferengi. thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. later. Pringle and his colleagues are stone wild by passing. Mm. What? Stone wall. That's what I said. No, said <laughs> stone wild. wild. I, said, said, well, I, I those, actually said came, wall, but it came out wild. Yeah, that's right. That's They're fine. Hot those wild. motherfuckers are stone wild. It's not a character flaw. <laughs> I'm just pointing out that you misspelled. Okay, it. okay, okay. okay. For 25 years, Mike's has been making lemonade the hard way. Mike's Hard Lemonade. Hard days deserve a hard lemonade. Mike's is hard. So is prison. Don't drive drunk. Premium all beverage with flavors. All registered trademarks used under license by Mike's Hard Lemonade Company, Chicago, Illinois.